Right. I mean, doesn't I mean that I mean that's that's the you know that that seems to be in the in the context of the the uh, the, the so called war on terror and the the, um, the the perception at least that this is an assault on civil liberties, which I I happen to share. Um, it it is. It seems to be, if that is the narrative of the Obama administration, is the codification of these things uh, in a way totally. that the Bush administration didn't, and in some respects is more dangerous if that's if 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 people share that that concern. I mean, what do you make of the the fact that there is? I mean, you know, people have said this, this is nothing new, but had the Bush administration been engaged in this, um, it would have uh, there would be a lot greater public outcry and certainly on the left yeah. right i mean it, the- oh no i mean there's no question about that right i mean I, th- I think it's unquestionably the case and i think a lot of conservatives have sort of delighted in pointing out that hypocrisy that was basically the point of Rupert murdoch's tweet once you s- substitute guantanamo for guatemala and i don't you know they're not wrong i mean it's true it's absolutely true and i think there's a combination of two things at play um one is hip- just straight up hypocrisy i mean just you know essentially partisanship in its purest, rawest form. Um, and I don't think that's really defensible, right? I mean, right. principles are principles, and you should apply those principles even when people that you voted for are in power. There is also a layer of this which is about trust, which I think is, 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 is a little different than the straight-up partisanship, um, which, which has to do with the fact that I don't think it's irrational that citizens... Um, have differential levels of trust towards different politicians and political parties, right? Like, for people to think, oh, I trust Barack Obama to judiciously exercise his power, but I wouldn't trust, you know, someone else, um, I don't buy that argument because I think the sort of the office ends up... Well, of course, right. I mean, that's... that's power is... Right, but it's not... I guess my point is that it's not... I think there's, there's a response from people who care about this and I include myself among them very much, and I think you are, of like, this is just hypocrisy and, and rank sort of partisan blindness. And there's part of that, but part of that is people just, you know, just do trust different people in different ways, right? And, I mean, look, if Paul Krugman were Treasury Secretary, I think I would give him more latitude if he made arguments about certain things than I would if Jamie Dimon were, right? Right, of course. Um, even if they were articulating the same policy, because I trust those two guys in very different ways, right? And so that's part of it also. There's a kind of sinister and a sinister kind of craven aspect to it, and then there's an aspect that I think is much less sinister and much less craven and much more normal and human, although I think something still to be wary of and, and vigilant against, which is the fact that we have different levels of trust for different kinds of political actors. Right. And, you know, I, the yeah. fundamental difference between your example and and this one and and the, and, and this one in terms of these civil liberties is we're talking actually about the law, you know it, it, that you know policies uh, come and go with administrations. Uh, right. This you know this goes beyond a policy uh, because what it is is it's setting down markers as to what constitutes law, which will yep. I mean at, at the very least you know depending on um, you know it, this this may not apply for for uh, you know for uh, Glenn Beck and Alex Jones, but presumably Br- uh, Br- Barack Obama will not be president in three and a half years. Uh, somebody right. else will, and so right. uh, you've already set the marker as to what whoever comes after uh, yep. is yep. legally yep. justified in doing. Yep. No, that's exactly. I mean, that's exactly right. Um, and you know, um, that's precisely what's problematic about it. And I also think, I mean, I, you know, for people that do find themselves inclined to, you know, uh, trust, you know, the president with this power, but they wouldn't trust Mitt Romney and. Um, you know the, the the history of this is pretty clear that 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 executive <laughs> broad assertions of executive authority lead to bad things um, in in anybody's hands and you know even people that I think are universally admired among Democrats to the left Franklin Roosevelt did horrible things with you know uh, uh, overly broad assertions of executive authority like interning Japanese people so right. you know the 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 history here is pretty clear and um, and I think. I think the the point you made, which I think to me the the big issue that we're not talking about, that is to me the defining problem, is what is the war on terror and when when and how can it end? Under what conditions will it end? Because one of the things that is invoked in the memo and is invoked was invoked throughout the Bush administration 
by both defenders within and without the administration, is invoked now within the Obama administration by, de- by defenders within and without, is, look, this is a war. It's a different kind of war than past wars. You have to create a new legal architecture to deal with that, right? People go through the reasoning. You know, Americans who signed up with the Nazis, we could kill them on a battlefield. No, that was not even constitutionally controversial. And I think people, you know, don't think that necessarily would be, right? I mean, if, you know, if someone, if some American defected to the Germans and was, you know, at um, Hitler's shoulder in the bunker and was, you know, firing at, at, as the Americans advanced or the Russians advanced, um, we think, sure, right, that person's a combatant, they're, they're subject to, to, to the laws of war, and it's, it's legitimate uh, for us to kill them. We wouldn't have to, like, go in and indict him or try to capture him, Right. Right. Um, and so the war metaphor is doing a tremendous amount of the a, 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 a tremendous amount of the the legal and logical work of justifying whatever is uh, you know at play, whether it was the suspension of habeas corpus or the denial of habeas corpus uh, in the early line of cases having to do with Guantanamo, whether it's the denial of due process rights um, in court and in, 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 you know as as articulated in the Constitution, the Bill of Rights in this case in Al case. And to me, the question is, okay, if it's a war, if it continues to be a war, name some condition under which it would be possible for right, this war to right. end. And well, I, that's what's that's, so nefarious about the war on terrorism is that it, what you're doing is you're, 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 all you need to do at that point is redefine the term war. And then all of a sudden, all of these analogies f- work for you. Uh, that's, that's what's problematic is that we have redefined the, 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 the term war to be almost without definition. Right, that's right, and 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 also to create, you know, uh, uh, essentially a, a permanent state of war, and right. and and I don't, you know, the the problem is if if what defines if what defines being at war is the existence of organized groups that wish to um, pull off attacks on the United States or its, you know, or or United States targets, you know, embassies, etc. I just don't see that condition ever not being met in the next hundred years. Well, I mean, really. ever. I mean, you know, has it ever I mean, been met? It's just I, like, mean, it's, right. I mean, it's never, that's the point is that the, uh, the word war really doesn't mean anything anymore. Uh, right. because, uh, you know, a war had some boundaries and definition. And once you sort of expand it beyond those boundaries and definition, the word is really sort of meaningless. It's just a perpetual state. Uh, and, you know, and- and one of the things I think, I, I, one of the questions I think to ask is, okay, if we don't, for those of us who don't like this, right, is like, what is, you know, I think we need to, to, to talk about, A, declaring an end to the war, and that would mean, you know, I think particularly um, at the same time that we're withdrawing from Afghanistan, right, would be a really uh, politically wise and mm-hmm. the moment to essentially declare an end to war, and get rid of the authorization use of military force past two weeks after uh, 9-11, which is essentially the statutory um, foundation of a lot of the, the, the war state as we currently are, right? Everything. And, also, yeah. and to articulate a vision of peacetime counterterrorism, right? right. Like, it, it, we should not have to be permanently at war to protect the American populace from essentially, you know, for mass murder <laughs> uh, carried out against civilians, we should be able to be a country at peace that also vigilantly pursues, you know, intelligence about people that are plotting to do terrible things and, presents, and prevents those plots. Those two things can coexist, right? Right now, we do not talk about it as if they can. And the, that, the, to me, the, is the place that we need to get to. The tragedy is, I think, to a certain extent, that's what John Kerry ran on. In many respects, it was yep. uh, at least was at one point was to convert this supposed war on terror into a sort of a police action uh, yep. where you you would no longer be operating under the the rubric of uh, the authorization for military force, and um, it, it's uh, that I mean that is you know. The, the words perpetual war really di- di- is, is oxymoronic in a way, in the sense that, right. you know, then war really has no meaning. It's just simply a license to do uh, essentially anything you want. Um, right. But, uh, you know, it's like a perpetual state of emergency. <laughs> that doesn't, right. you can't really have one of those. Uh, and it, well, and it's funny, like, I, 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 I'll start this by saying, you know, I'm not, um, 
I'm not in, in, in by no means am I equating the U.S. post 9/11 to the uh, e- Egypt under under Hosni Mubarak. Um, but you know, we, we look at Mubarak and we look at Egypt as you know the 25 years of the emergency laws, and we sort of like chuckle as like that's like just the classic dictator gambit, right? Mm-hmm. Like we you know like oh it's always an emergency. The emergency laws are always but like look you know you know they they did have the leader of their country assassinated by a terrorist, right? <laughs> like there were like it's it wasn't irrational that afterwards they were like uh, we gotta you know get our stuff together and you know, maybe change some things about the way our laws work to make sure that we don't, you know, we don't have the Muslim Brotherhood killing our, our, our leaders. But of course, then that state just hung around and it, you know, proved incredibly um, toxic to any kind of democratic aspirations. And, you know, the U.S. is an incredibly different place for a, a million different reasons. But the idea of a permanent state of emergency should strike as an as anathema, and yet we've all been, I think, pretty subtly like lulled into just thinking about it as such. Because one of the things I, I see in discussion of targeted killing is people say, "Well, this is better than invading, right? We don't want to invade Yemen," yeah. and that was basically the perspective of the neocons and George W. Bush in the last administration, and that was such a disaster. And look, we ended up in Iraq, and so what do you want? Like that's as if those are the two alternatives, both of which, you know, essentially assume that there has to be some kind of war action. Right. Right. And the question is, how big will the war be? How targeted or narrow will the war be? There's going to be a war. We're going to take, you know, we are going to go out and kill people all over the globe. Should we kill them with machines from above in a targeted way? Should we kill them indiscriminately with with armies and and subject our, um, you know, fellow citizens to death and, and, and injury and, and destruction um, through ground invasions. And, you know, the third option is the United States should be at peace. <laughs> you know, that's what we should aim for. That's the goal. And you can be at peace even if people are not, do not feel peaceful towards you. I mean, that, that to me actually um, is, is, is the big conceptual breakthrough we need. And I think, and I understand why that might sound scary to people, because there is a degree to which, you know, peace is not unilaterally imposed, right? Um, You know, peace is struck between different entities. But just because there is the existence of of actors out there, non-state actors, that are plotting to and wish to do, you know, horrible things to, to American citizens, does not mean we need to be at war. We we need to find uh, the next version of some type of like of a cold war, I guess, in some respects. I mean, and, and you think about that. We've, you know, we've always had the auspices of war, uh, even when we weren't at war via the Cold War in some respects. But uh, we need to find another uh, because it just doesn't seem like uh, you know, and it, the American uh, sort of sensibility will accept we're at peace right now. 